it is a huge honor today. Uh, I just love technology. I, I'm sitting here with uh, Dr. Guy Yatros, and he's in Bradenton, Florida, which is south of Tampa, Florida, north of Sarasota, right? Correct. And Richard Drake, who's in, uh, where are you at in Texas? San Antonio, right in the center of Texas. It's that, it's that state in the middle of the country. I love the river walk there. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, exactly. The river walk is the neatest thing. I've uh, lectured uh, there a few times, and uh, man, that is amazing. And you guys are at the front of probably the uh, the next big thing in dentistry. I mean, uh, in the last, you know, I got out in 87, and it seems like every five years or something, and it seems like um, right now you're at the forefront of dental sleep medicine, and it's just exploding. Let me, uh, let me um, read your bios. Dr. Guy Yatros has been practicing dental sleep medicine for over a dozen years and is well-respected international lecturer in the field of sleep disorder breathing and dental sleep medicine. He has offices in Bradenton, Sarasota, and Tampa, Florida, devoted exclusively to the treatment of, dent of sleep disorder breathing. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, past president of the Manatee Dental Society, and is an affiliate assistant professor of the Department of Internal Medicine with the University of South Florida College of Medicine. He is a co-founder of the Dental Sleep Solutions System for the successful implementation of dental sleep medicine and dental practices around the U.S. And then Dr. Richard Drake is co-founder of Dental Sleep Solutions and has been practicing dental sleep medicine exclusively for over 12 years. He has delivered thousands of dental devices and is a sought after and respected educator, lecturer in the dental sleep medicine community. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine and has previously served as President-Elect, Secretary, Treasurer, and Board of Director for the AADSM. He is a part-time faculty member of the University of Texas Health Science Center Dental School in San Antonio. Gentlemen, thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. Um, I think it's very amusing when people say, uh, well, they don't know if this is uh, something they should get into and if there's enough um, patients that need this. When there's guys like you who do this, that's all you do. You guys don't do root canals and crowns and pull wisdom teeth, do you? Uh, not anymore, we don't. Uh, <laughs> Rich hasn't done it for quite a long time. What, 14 years, Rich, since you've done anything like years that? Now. Yeah, my, my wife chipped a tooth the other day. I said, you sure you want me to fix that? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. You didn't? <laughs> So, so to, to address the need, I mean, the need is huge, and that's one of the reasons Rich and I got involved in this, because uh, we started doing it in our practices, and we realized that uh, a lot of patients have sleep disorder breathing, and even furthermore, the ones that have it uh, don't have a, have a treatment. As many as one in five adults has uh, at least mild apnea, and the majority of those people don't know they have it, and once they know they have it, uh, they're not successfully treated because oftentimes they're maybe given a CPAP and, uh, and they're not wearing it effectively, and, and maybe they haven't been given the other option, which is a, a dental device that works quite well for, for, most, uh, for a lot of the patients. Well, well, take us back in time. How did you go from pulling wisdom teeth and doing fillings and crowns to doing this exclusively? Yeah, I want to tell my story real quick, Guy, if that's all right. You know, sure. I'm a big fisherman, Howard, and I went to I went to the uh, Amazon jungle to fish for peacock bass, trip of a lifetime, right? And I, I get stuck in a tent with a guy snorts so loud he scared the monkeys away at night, you know? And I thought, <laughs> my guy, I said, how does your wife sleep with you? He said, oh, we haven't slept in the same bedroom for, for a decade. And, and, you know, I didn't even know what sleep apnea was. I was your typical dentist out there. You know, I had a couple patients that had it, and, I, and so I started taking taking a couple of courses and back then guy uh, there wasn't anybody to call you know who do, right. who'd you take a course from or who do you call if you have a question like that so uh, that that's kind of how I started to get into it and I just kind of got you know grabbed me grabbed a hold of me pretty good and the next thing you know I came home and told my wife I'm selling my practice and you know for 14 years now all I've done, done is dental sleep medicine so that's how I got into it one more reason to go fishing I love uh... <laughs> Well, I love my uh, my classmate from UMKC, Craig Syke, and I. We always go to Cabo, and we've got every fish imaginable. I, I love fishing. How did you get into it, Guy? Yeah, my story's different, but uh, some similarities. Uh, you know, I, I was running. A, I had a dental practice on Anna Maria Island, uh, just uh, uh, just west of here, the nice beach. 
uh, office I had for 22 years almost. And uh, as I was treating my patients and developing my practice, I, I developed what we called Island Dental Spa. I became a, really a, a fee-for-service practice, did a lot of prosthetic dentistry. And one day one of my patients came in and, uh, and she said, you know, I've, I've been diagnosed uh, with apnea. I've tried a CPAP and my physician says there's something you can do as a dentist to, to help this. And this was about 14 years ago. And I said, uh, really, I, I, I guess maybe I can. And I just so happened that day to have a, 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 an advertisement from one of the labs uh, making mandibular man advancement devices and uh, not being afraid to try things and not really knowing uh, that much about it. I called the lab and they said, just take a couple of impressions and send it to us. And that's what I did. And I handed it to the lady and, uh, and she, you know, a few days later is just singing my praises saying, wow, I feel better. My husband's happy. And, you know, she, I think she said I was a genius, uh, which, uh, I mean, what I did was took a couple of impressions and sent it to the lab. So well, this is, this is kind of fun. Uh, you know, the patients like me and before long, the physician who, uh, who, uh, who was her primary care and, uh, started, uh, sending me some patients as well as a sleep physician, because they thought that, uh, I knew a little bit about this. And, you know, truth of the matter is I, I really didn't know what I was doing at the time. I was just kind of you know, winging it. And that's when I met uh, my mentor who's uh, here on the call with us, Rich Drake. Uh, I was trying to find a place to learn how to do this. And, you know, 12 uh, years ago or a dozen years ago, or so there, there were no courses. There was no guideline on how to do this. There was no, you know, here's what you do, steps A to Z. And, and I met Rich through the AADSM as a mentor. They assigned him to me. And I think that's the day that he went from fishing a lot to working a whole lot more <laughs> <laughs> because, because, uh, he and I started trying to figure out how, you know, this is fun to do, but how do we make it profitable? How do we, how do we, you know, what systems we need in place? And, and it was frustrating back then. And I started doing more and more and learning that I didn't know what I didn't know. And uh, uh, over time, we, we, you know, we started making this a, a more enjoyable thing to do in our practice and started learning how to deal with all the, the obstacles and hurdles that, that come together. And, you know, Rich and I uh, worked on this together. And I just became passionate about it. And that part of the business grew and grew and grew as, as, as a whole separate business to the point where it was overrunning my, my restorative practice. Actually, it was doing better than my, you know, pretty decent uh, uh, restorative practice. And I had to make a decision at one point. And uh, uh, after going through an associate and deciding that my love and passion now was to do this, it was just very enjoyable. Uh, I decided a, a, a little over two years ago to sell my restorative practice to, to do just this. And then, of course, our other business where we help dentists doing uh, just this, helping uh, dentists in dental sleep medicine. So uh, that's how our paths kind of mingled, and we, here we are today. And what is your other business? It's, it's www.dentalsleepsolutions.com. What, what, is, that, is that where you're teaching dentists how to do this? Yeah, and another that's this the that website is uh, more patient centric, and you can get to our implementation system from that site. A better website would be uh, www.ds3 ds and the number three software.com, and that's uh, basically we help dentists become successful in dental sleep. Uh, having done thousands and thousands of these devices, uh, we we basically have. Uh, systems for the uh, uh, hurdles in dental sleep, uh, which, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I'm uh, co-authoring a, uh, a uh, an article next uh, month uh, in, uh, in 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 your in your uh, publication about those four pillars and how they uh, the challenges. Uh, are, are, are if we can meet those in our practices, that we can uh, uh, can be successful. And what are those four pillars? Well, you well, we can, you, you, you got to have a way to screen somebody, you know, when you, you got these practice, because you, 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 one of the ways you started this, Howard, was, well, look, these, these dentists are out there, should we get into this, should we do this, you know, where do the patients come from? Uh, last time I checked, they come, they're actually sitting in your dental chairs in your office. You know, that, that's where they come from, like Guy said. You know, we got 40 million people that have this disease and only 10% know it. So that lowest hanging fruit out there, those patients walking through your office every day, right? But you got to have a way to screen them. Then you got to have a way to get them tested, right? You got to have a way to treat them. That's, that's what we do with the dental devices. And of course, you got to have a way to get paid. So those are the four pillars that uh, that, that article guy wrote is is going to be in there next week. But in between those things, you got a couple of hurdles and things like that. So, you know, the typical dentist, you know, how do you screen somebody? Well, uh, you know, that my, my, when I, I think back to when I started and I'm giving somebody a shot, you know, to do a filling and they fall asleep. 
I thought that was because I was such a good dentist. <laughs> I didn't know it was because they were half dead from sleep apnea, right? So, you know, these people are right under our noses all the time. But, but you know, and Guy and I got into this and we started doing this and the whole, whole, the whole challenge, there's all these hurdles. You know, one of the, one of the uh, analogies I use is you go to a local high school and you, you go around the, the football track, right? There's 10 hurdles out there. And, and the typical dentist, he might get over one, and then he might, you know, fall down on the second one, the third one. So those four big hurdles are the pillars that we talk about. And, and that's what we, we decided to do, was, was how can we help dentists help these people? And, and that's what literally changed our lives as we started to get into to this and we started to put systems together where you do that so in our individual practices we've grown this to be very successful right and and I've done that completely independently of guy uh, you know our software system we, we, we have the dental sleep solution software that's where the DS3 came from but but really we are a system that does this you know you're gonna have a thousand questions uh, about which device do you use or how do you screen a patient or how do you get them sleep tested and that's kind of what we've been doing for what guy maybe seven or eight years now is is, is right. distilling that system down to something that's very efficient so what what are what are questions we should be asking and the hygienist should be asking patients to see um, what, what are the red flags that they have um, sleep disorders and are you sending them home with a device to um, test them while they sleep, where they take something home and <clears throat> apply um, leads, you know, electronic leads to them to measure themselves, or do you recommend that they go to a a, um, a sleep center? Uh, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> so, so all those above, uh, we do. But uh, so we'll break down the first two: first screening and then testing. Uh, so you're exactly right, Howard. They need to be asking questions. Uh, again, a, a huge number, of, uh, as much as 20% of the adults in these uh, patients' practices have uh, untreated, undiagnosed, for the most part, obstructive sleep apnea. So if we have a good screening process that uh, we can, uh, can identify these patients uh, that need to be tested, that's the first step. And every office, whether, whether you uh, want to treat these patients or not, really needs to become involved in this. I think uh, as we talk about it in our courses, uh, the, the, the ob obstruction, the, the problem has to do with the tongue, has to do with the throat, it has to do with the things that are in our, our wheelhouse. And so uh, we have a screening system that we digitize that makes that easier. Uh, there's other ones out there on the internet. Uh, so basically a questionnaire uh, does a pretty good job of, of, of identifying the people at high risk. Uh, things like the Epworth Sleepiness Scale uh, is one that you can, uh, new people out there can Google and it uh, tells whether people are subjectively sleepy or not. Stop Bang is another questionnaire we can use. And the questions that are on those typically have to do with sleepiness, snoring, um, are, to, are the big ones. And then uh, comorbidities are huge. Uh, there is such a strong uh, relationship that there's uh, independently associated with untreated sleep apnea or certain uh, health issues such as high blood pressure, diabetes. And so if we start uh, realizing that, do you realize that, that a half of the people who have AFib have obstructive sleep apnea, over a third of the hypertensive patients. So as we start learning this information, uh, that, that's the kind of questions we need to ask. And it, it can take less time than doing an oral cancer screening, five minutes or so to do the screening. Uh, then as far as the, uh, the, the testing, we can talk about that in a second. Did that uh, cover the, the screening, you think, well enough? Well, one thing on the screening, do you believe that um, when dentists are making a grinding, a night guard, that without a sleep study that they could be missing – uh, that uh, the sleep disorder that there's a comorbidity between grinding and and that do you believe that if a dentist is going to make you an upper um, you know a guard for for grinding your teeth at night that they should be screened for sleep medicine well if, if they don't Howard they're missing it 75% of the time I mean that's where the studies are coming out so you, you got to use your brain, though, right? I mean, that's that guy teases me all the time because I say that a lot. You know, if you got a 14-year-old girl that's all stressed out and her TMJ is killing her, you know, the likelihood that she has sleep disorder breathing is probably very low. But you got to use your brain and think about it. You know, if you got a 54-year-old ball-headed fat guy like me, right, uh, who's tired and, and he's grinding and he's stressed out and you, you know well uh, what else well yeah he's got high blood pressure you talk about the red flags you know uh, he's pre-diabetic you know he's got this he's got that and all the 
with other stuff. So yeah, you, 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 you've got to use your brain though. You can't, I, I think the days are gone where somebody's stressed out and you make them a night guard. That, that, that just doesn't make sense anymore. So, uh, but you, again, you got to use your brain. You know, not everybody that you make a night guard for has sleep apnea, but most, a, a lot of them do. So you would say, you would guess that on average, three out of four times a dentist makes a night guard for a patient, they probably have underlying sleep disorder? Yes. That's huge. Yeah, when was the last time, Rich, you made a flat plane splint without first testing the patient? I mean, would you recommend doing that you've, uh, it, it, with your patients? I, I haven't done it for 14 years, but do we make... Well, do we make night guards for patients? Yes, we do. You know, sometimes you, you got to treat TM dysfunction just to get their patient's mouth open far enough to take an impression, right? I mean, but you got to use your brain. Again, you know, young uh, females that need a lot of night guard and TMJ stuff, not a lot of them have sleep disorder breathing. So, again, you, you got to use your brain. One, one fact that I'll throw out there, too, is uh, there's a book called The Principles and Practice of Sleep Medicine, and that's kind of the, the sleep Bible. The sleep physicians use it. Uh, it's a big 1,700-page book that, that, that I read when I took my, my diplomate board. And um, in there, they, they quote that uh, uh, patients who, uh, who have OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, brux their teeth three times more. Uh, often, uh, the prevalence of bruxism is three times higher in OSA patients than non-OSA patients. And there's also studies to show that uh, on OSA patients that even a, a, a CPAP can de uh, decrease bruxism incidence uh, uh, pretty, pretty notably. So there is a relationship, undoubtedly, in a, in, in a lot of the patients, but we don't want to go off to the extreme where we say everybody who bruxes right. has this problem. Uh, but it's a good point. sure, whether it's 75%, 50%, 80%, I, you know, the numbers are maybe somewhat questionable, but to ignore the airway in your bruxine patients is a big mistake. And once you realize the airway has something to do with it, I wish I'd have known now what I knew then. I could say that about a lot of stuff, but uh, especially when I, the big rehab cases I used to do that uh, failed uh, or had uh, problems with occlusion and, and breakage, uh, I, I think back now, and if I'd have known what I know now, uh, a lot of those cases may have uh, turned out a little bit differently or not had the challenges that, that I was faced with when I was restoring those cases. Okay, so let's move to testing then. So now you've been talking to this patient chair side. They snore. They're tired a lot. Sometimes they fall asleep in the day, and you're, you've got some red flags. What would you do next? Do we get this, Rich? Yeah, yeah well, there there's a couple of different ways to to get a patient tested. I think I think we sit them down, have a little bit of a talking to, you know, in a very short way. Uh, again, this is a lot of this is where the rubber meets the road, Howard. Where I mean, you've been in you've been in a few dental offices in your days, right? So you, you know, you go in there and you you look at the hygienist and and there's got this bombed out tooth and you you go, well, did you take a PA, you know, did you talk to him about a root canal and a crown, you know, I mean, it's the same kind of thing, you know, the hygienist is in there, they're cleaning teeth, they're doing that, they can be talking to him about getting a sleep test, so we have national home sleep testing companies, okay, that, that in DS3, you just click a button, and when you click a button, a home sleep test shows up at their home, they can do it at home, right? And, and that's for the, in all 50 states? Uh, the only state that a dentist can't order that is uh, New Jersey, I believe, right now. The, so, the, you, you know, 49 out of the 50 states, you can do that. I mean, that's certainly one way that you can do that. So, uh, a part of the part of this Canada? uncharted area that we're looking at a little bit, though, Howard, is who, who, who takes the bull by the horns here? You know, as a dentist, we're looking at these people every day. We're seeing their crowded airways. We're asking questions. We're seeing the red flags. Now we got to get this guy tested, right? So, you can implement a home sleep testing solution through your dental practice in 49 of the 50 states right now where you order that. But, but dentists cannot diagnose this. So you still need a physician to look at that sleep test results and make the diagnosis and then to write the prescription and a lot of times to get paid for this, I'm putting the cart before the horse here a little bit, but you need a letter of medical necessity saying, hey, not only does this guy have sleep disorder breathing, which I've diagnosed, but it's medically necessary to treat. So that option, right, home sleep test or in-lab sleep test, most of the time is made by the insurance carrier themselves because they'll only pay for one or the other. 
right? So what do patients ask? Hey, you need a sleep test. Okay, well, where can I get one? What will they pay for, right? So we, we can start that process through the home sleep test where we can send it home with them. You know, we work with several companies that do that around the country. Uh, you can work with their primary care physicians. You have local sleep labs that are run by mostly board-certified sleep pulmonologists, right? So do you have a relationship with that person in your, in your, pra in your community, right? Some, some lot of dead in this practice in communities where they only have one sleep lab. You know, they might only have one option uh, aside from a mail order. So uh, that, that is one of the pillars because it is very much a challenge. You know, and we go back and we look at the big picture here. We go, okay, wow, 40 million people have sleep apnea. How come we can't get them tested? Because most people don't want to go to a sleep lab, right? You're going to video me while I sleep? I'm not really sure what I do while I sleep, right? I'm not sure I want a video of me while I'm sleeping. So, you know, these are all things that go through people's head. How come, how come they don't want a sleep study? Well, I don't want to wear that CPAP, right? I mean, some people won't even go get a sleep test because they do that. So th there's a couple of barriers here, and it's, part of them is the system itself, but part of them is, is inside that patient's head. He already has preconceived ideas. I'm not going to get sleep tests because I'm not going to wear CPAP, you know. So we've got a lot of hurdles out there, and we've got a lot of barriers that we have to try to break down. So if you called it Hot Nurses Sleep Testing Lab, do you think, <laughs> you think we would get more people to go get tested? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly some. And just to be clear, uh, you know, we're not uh, experts on state uh, uh, dental laws. And, uh, you know, currently uh, most states uh, uh, don't um, uh, prohibit dentists from ordering that state. And you should check with your, your state dental laws as to whether you can, can or can't do that. And Medicare has its own set of rules that we have to go by. And I think just to summarize what Rich said, which I think he said real well, is there's two ways of getting our patients tested. When we started this, the only way of doing it was sending the patient to the sleep lab. A lot of the hurdles, these pillars are actually lower. The, 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 the hurdles, as Rich called them, uh, have lowered. So now, now there's home sleep testing. And that's for sure. I mean, insurance companies approve them. It's, it's an approved way to be tested. And in my opinion, a, a preferred way to be, to be tested. And we can help implement that by referring we can help in most states by maybe ordering it with uh, one of the companies we work with, and we can help by maybe having our own equipment even that we can dispense. And so that's part of the, what we help is we help set up those systems, and, and someone in the office has to be accountable for that. There's a gap between, yeah, you're at high risk for this and getting the patient tested, and we recommend that someone in the office really be kind of the sleep champion or at least a knowledgeable person so that they can discuss why the person was at high risk and go, by the way, okay, you're at high risk. We need to get you a test. Here's your options out there. Let's look at your insurance, what they're going to pay for, and let's go get this test. Most of them are a couple hundred dollars or less. Let's just get you tested. We'll have you back in about three weeks to discuss it. That's the kind of conversations that we have with our people we work with because you just got to make it routine. Uh, it, this isn't something new or, or, or different. Uh, it shouldn't feel that way. It should uh, be in the offices just like anything else. And we need to become comfortable with this in our dental practices. And it, it's important. We started this because we truly saw a, a, a need. And, uh, and if the offices care about their patients, they need to at least get to the first two hurdles. They need to get their patients screened, and they need to help them get tested. Whether they want to treat the patients or not, that's, there's other dentists who can do, do it if they don't want to get involved with that aspect of it. And when you, um, so you're talking to the patient, you think they have sleep, um, you can go to ds3software.com and there's a place there where you can click um, to have your patient get a home sleep, um, what is it, delivered to their house? Is it mailed to them? Does someone show up? There's different companies that do that. No, to be clear, uh, the ds3software.com just explains our services. It explains uh, how we help with all these, uh, these pillars. We either uh, have a, a specific solution that we deliver for these pillars, or we help implement those. And so once you sign up for our service, and by the way, our service is only a few hundred dollars a month. Uh, we help the dentists implement this in their, in, in, in their practices. And with that service, then, then they have a specific what, part of what we have is a really robust uh, web-based, cloud-based software that's an EMR that helps these dentists implement dental sleep. And so once they have access to that, uh, the patients can input their data through a web portal. And then uh, once they're screened and identified at being high risk, uh, then, uh, then, then basically, yes, we, we have a way that we can order the test with some of our uh, home sleep testing partners that will deliver it to their door. 
they'll, uh, with instructions, the patient wears the, the test uh, for one to maybe up to three nights. They send it back, so they would do it in the comfort of their home. Uh, the test is interpreted by a board-certified sleep physician, and the results are delivered back to that dentist's office. And then we recommend that the dentist sets up an appointment in about three weeks to, to review that. Now, again, Rich mentioned that, that doesn't necessarily uh, we, uh, preclude us from uh, working with, nor do we encourage work, not working with the medical community. But now we have some information to share with the medical community and then start involving the primary care at this point. Uh, hey, look, we've identified this patient to be, uh, it appears to have some airway problems. Can we get your input on it? And, uh, and, and let's get this patient treated either with a CPAP or a dental device, which, by the way, are the two uh, first-line therapy recommended treatments by the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. So you have the complete program. Uh, how much is it? You said a couple hundred. What is that? One ninety nine, two ninety nine. Uh, it's it's uh, you know currently it's three ninety nine a month uh, is is our is, is our is our fee, uh, uh, and you know if you look at what we do for that, uh, you know. We want pay, uh, these dentists to stick with us for a long time. And so I think the difference between us and a lot of the other companies out there that say that they, they help with everything, most of the other companies have one aspect of it. Maybe they have software. Maybe they have uh, uh, sleep testing. Maybe they do insurance billing. Uh, we do uh, many of those aspects ourselves, but we, our, our, our service is helping you do this. And if we don't help you, uh, Howard, if you sign up for our service for uh, a few hundred dollars a month, uh, whatever it is, and uh, after six months, if you're not doing dental devices or after a year, uh, what are you going to do? If you're not watching your cable, what do you do? You, you turn it off. Right, you, you you discontinue our services, so we in a sense have skin in the game because our goal is to make dental offices successful, and uh, and we want long-term uh, partners and relationships with our members. So there's no contract; they could stop any time. Depends on the, the you know just like any other contract. It's you 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 pay more if you want to go by the month, and there's an activation fees and uh, for for uh, short-term contracts. But how in many, general, how- most contracts are about a year. So do you have on this uh, three ninety nine a month at ds three software dot com? Do you have all the educational videos? I mean, could they, or is it online courses? Yeah, embedded in, embedded inside the software, we 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 have uh, ways that they can they can actually go through an edX platform or other things, right? So you log into the software, and then from the software we have, I think we have, what now, 12 hours of CE that everybody, the dentist and all their staff can get. We have a, a something called Snoozle, which we've trademarked, right, kind of like the snooze and the Google part. And uh, we got about 250 articles in there, so you can type in, you know, from your software, you can type in, what does AHI stand for? What's moderate sleep apnea? Uh, how do I bill for Medicare? You can do all of these types of things. So it's kind of like a dedicated search engine for dental sleep medicine. So th- those are just all of those things that, that kind of, you, it's hard to get it for a typical dentist to get his arms around. You know, how do you screen somebody? How do you get them tested? You know, how do you treat them now? What kind of device do you want to make? So we have, we have uh, I don't know, guy, what? 30 different uh, educational uh, programs in there about how to choose the correct device and and then of course the billing part you guys should do a uh, one two three four hour overview of all this uh, for an online C course on Dentaltown um, we put up 350 courses on Dentaltown and they've been viewed over half a million times uh, today we just released um, 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 Nuts and bolts treatment planning uh, by uh, Dr. Michael Melkers, but I, I think um, you know I get so many questions about this. Um, maybe if you maybe you guys should do the uh, you know uh, an intro on the screening, testing, treatment, billing, and put up there. I, I think it might turn out to be one of the best marketing things you did. I think you'd probably get a lot of followers. Well, great. Well, we're very interested in it. And we finish with this. We'll talk to you more about how how to make that happen. Uh, that sounds like a, like a great idea. To, to be clear, all that information that Rich just went over is available after you become a member. If you go to our website right. now, it just tells about those services that are available, all the education and so forth is not available to non-members. Uh, the website you will see just uh, highlights what you get if you decide to, to help us implement this. And, and I can tell you, having gone through this with Rich as my mentor and us trying to figure this out, uh, I mean, I think about all the time we spent trying to make this a viable part of our practice, uh, to have a, a, basically a consulting group to help you uh, do this along the way. If, if you, you want to do this, now, I mean, you still have to put some effort into it. It's not 
uh, plug and play and, and, and everything. we do it all for you. You have to have staff meetings. But we, we found that they spend about most offices around 20 hours of time. Uh, and this is highly, highly staff driven. Uh, and you got good, uh, good staff members who, who want to take this by, bull by the horns, uh, that the offices can be up and running. And you can basically build a, uh, as, as the sky's the limit, you can build a whole other practice within your practice. And yeah, you can make a lot of money, but that's, that's not the, really our motivation. You can really help a lot of people. And it's just, compared to the uh, things I used to do in dentistry, the stress is so, so much less and the rewards are so high uh, that you get uh, uh, patients who just love you and just think you've hung the moon, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it has a lot of the uh, less stress in a, a lot of areas than general dentistry does. So, so it's a, lot, nice a lot of dentists have emailed me asked, saying things like, you know, they've heard that to get into this, you know, some programs cost like a hundred grand. Um, other lectures they go to, you know, they need to buy, you know, a five thousand dollar take home testing device. Um, are there big economic barriers to entry? I mean, are some because some of these programs are a hundred grand. I mean, literally six figures. Have you heard of some of these? Yeah, we have, and and we're, we're not here to, to put anybody down. You know, some of those programs out there, uh, they provide quite a bit of service for for that. And you would think if you're going to pay that much, they'd certainly hold your hand along the way, right? And I think that the most of those do, but you don't have to do that, right? I mean, we're we're still in a little bit, Howard, of this wild, wild west, you know? I mean, we're still trying to figure out a lot of this stuff, you know? I mean, think back when I started 14 years ago, you know, my office burned down three years ago. Kind of a weird story, right? I had 20 home sleep testing units in my office what? when that happened. I don't have any now, okay? So there, there's different ways of doing that if you want to have if you want to buy one you can do it what we try to teach Dennis how to do is how to do this at the, at the, at the bare minimum and be efficient at it right so if, if you want to go out there and spend money I would certainly ask for referrals from those people and are they delivering on the product and what they do uh, we're certainly happy we've got several hundred people using our software and our systems and they're there I would say 90% of them are very happy and in and, and the 10% that aren't I don't think they're unhappy with us as much as like guy said they're just not doing it right so you know if we get back to the kind of the screening part when we were talking about after that how do you get them tested you know the typical dentist would say hey you know what Jim uh, man you really need to get that sleep study done I see you in six months right well the What's this? What's the sense of urgency? You you might have have this disease that's killing you. You know what? What do you say, guy? You use the analogy about the the cancer, right? Yeah, I mean, if you had someone that came in and uh, here in Florida, if it was a uh, a commercial fisherman, let's say, and their vermilion border was all gone because of sun damage, and there was a really nasty looking uh, uh, something not normal on his lower lip, how many of you could get this patient to go get that looked at? I mean, we would say, you've got to go get this looked at. We wouldn't use the word cancer. We'd say, we're worried about it, uh, like we would say, we're worried about your airway. It's going to cost more than a sleep test, and it's going to be a whole lot more painful. But we'd get them to do it. And the difference is that, 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 uh, dis, um, that uh, not cancer, but the, um, the, the uh, <laughs> lesion, that's the word I was looking for, sorry. The lesion that we're looking at, it's just right in front of us. And I think it's just glowing at us is the difference. Uh, untreated obstructive sleep apnea, undiagnosed untreated uh, obstructive sleep apnea is more subtle. It's just not something you can just see like that. And that's why it's harder to get these patients uh, uh, attested uh, because it's, it's, it's not as obvious as something we can see. Uh, but if we believe in it to the same extent, we can certainly uh, make our patients understand that and they'll, they'll get taste, tested. I mean, it just comes down uh, uh, to that with it. Richard, what did you uh, do to your girlfriend that made her burn your dental office down? <laughs> are you gonna, are you, your business. This is dentistry uncensored. So, so to be clear, um, you guys, you're saying you can get in, you can learn more about dental sleep medicine and, and start doing this without buying a take-home kit, a, a take-home testing device for five six seven thousand dollars as of sure now with the with the uh, companies that test and working with your local physicians absolutely I mean as, as, as Rich said we don't want to disparage anybody spending more money but uh, we also encourage you to look at anybody who's trying to help you implement dental sleep uh, see what they're selling take a look at it see how much it costs see what they're really going to help you with and then look at our service and we are the best value by a long shot for what we do. You can go to our website, call any of our members, and Rich said the 90%, uh, 
uh, we have huge customer service uh, 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 high marks. And what Rich said is uh, even the people who we call, we're proactive. We're like a personal trainer. We call them up, hey, are you doing this? How many pa patients have you screened? Why aren't you screening your patients? So even the pa people who maybe haven't taken the time, that may be that 10%, they're still going to tell you, you know what, those guys, right. uh, that company, we have a whole uh, uh, team of customer service reps that their job is to make you successful doing this. And uh, the customer satisfaction is great because for what we're charging, we're delivering a huge amount of value. I don't think anybody's even close to it when it comes to that. And yes, you can do it without making those purchases. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not like it was in the past. We don't have to have home sleep testing equipment. There are things but that we want to purchase. I, I want to add, fun. guy. I want to add too, though, guy. That it, Howard, if a guy has a home sleep testing device that he's bought, right? We're going to teach him how to use it in his practice. Right. Absolutely. We're not going to tell him, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, you heard me say. I I had 20 of them at one point, right? So uh, anybody out there listening to this wants to send me one, I'll take it, right? I mean, because we've got plenty <laughs> of ways to use them, you know? But, but th th we're a little bit in that wild, wild west still, and we're still trying to figure out, you know, how some of this stuff works. And that's, that's part of what you're paying us for is that's what we do all day, every day, right? And that's what we try to Okay, look, look, try let's to get go on next. We, we talked about screening. We talked about testing. But let's say it all comes back and we need to treat this patient. It, it, what what is the full distribution if you treat 100 patients? I mean, we've heard uh, um, some will need CPAP, some will need um, dental appliances. Um, we've even heard orthodontic surgeons saying that a lot of these people could be instantly fixed um, with orthodontic surgery. So talk talk about treatment now. Go ahead, guy. You can start. All right, I'll start with that. You know, so. Uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine recently came out with an update to their practice parameters uh, as far as it pertains to treating uh, patients who are diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea and what their treatment options are. And to kind of summarize that, and you can read all 50-something pages, and we even have a, a webinar that we, uh, that we, that we did uh, on, on, on that, those practice parameters, but essentially it comes down to there are really two first line of therapy treatments, CPAP and dental devices. CPAP works better more predictably, so in other words, if you hook a CPAP up to someone, it's going to more predictably open up their airway, okay, when no one's going to argue that. The negative is a lot of people won't wear the CPAP, okay, so it doesn't work if you don't wear it. Now, dental devices have and a little less. And explain what CPAP stands for. Oh, sorry, thank you. It stands for continuous positive air pressure. So basically, it's a pump that blows air into the airway, and it blows open the obstruction with positive pressure, and it works by having a mask uh, or a nose cannula, somehow uh, something attached to the, the, to the patient with a hose hooked to basically a blower that blows the airway open. And it efficiently blows open the airway in most cases, not all cases, but the problem is compliance. Can you, can you do you have to sleep on your back with that? Could you sleep on your like like I sleep face down? How how would how would that work if you're asleep on your belly? Well, it would be much more difficult, if not impossible. The uh, you know the mask can get moved to the side, and it can get air leaks. You're going to be have this mask in your face that's going to have to be uh, attached to the hose. So yeah, it, it works much better when the patients lay on the supine or back position, and, and they have to carry this with them when they travel. They've got to find a plug to plug it in. Uh, it can you know causes a. Uh, some patients to get dried out, so they have humidifiers, and they've come a long way. But uh, uh, the the bottom line is, you're tethered to a hose that's uh, attached to a pump that has to uh, hook on the nose or mouth. Uh, the worse your apnea is, the higher the pressure, and the, so the mask has got to fit well enough to to not have leaks. And uh, uh, for the patients who who can't tolerate it, which is significant numbers, uh, dental devices are recommended. But that being said, it's not just people who can't wear CPAP, because the CPAP. Uh, Again, to review, higher chance of opening the airway, uh, but less chance of compliance. Dental devices have a little less chance of, of, of uh, predictably opening the airway, but we have a far higher compliance. And so when you look at them together, uh, they work equally as well for most symptom relief and, and, and many times as far as health benefits is what the uh, practice parameter stated. So basically when we look at treating apnea, those are the two choices and uh, that's what we help educate our our members on is you know you know we got to have real conversations. Sometimes a CPAP's better for patients. The more severe the disease, the the more likely we might want to do CPAP. The less severe we might 
want to do dental devices, but anybody who can't wear a CPAP uh, really should consider a mandibular advancement device before they do something more invasive like MMA surgery. Uh, MMA surgery, a maxillomandibular advancement yeah. surgery, is very predictable. I mean, it's very successful, maybe over 90% by a lot of uh, studies, but it's uh, a whole lot more involved than wearing a piece of uh, acrylic in the jaw every night. So you would say the uh, MMA mandibular Maxillary, Ma maxillary mandibular, mandibular, mandibular advancement, advancement. Um, that, that would probably have the lowest compliance and the highest cost, correct? Well, well, I, I, mean, I, mean, oh, I mean, I've done this 28 years. When you tell or <laughs> orthodontic people about orthodontic surgery, uh, men don't seem to be very interested in that. Uh, women, if they think it's going to make them a lot better looking, will do it. But oh, The lowest acceptance, I think you meant, uh, not compliance. Yeah. Yes, uh, I mean... Uh, we're doing more and more of that. Uh, I'm, I'm recommending it the more on patients who are younger, who are not obese, who, you know, and so we, we do have patients that do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to get the patient to agree to this, to get insurance to pay for it, it's quite expensive. Uh, there are risks associated with it. And, uh, and go, go through my, uh, my bias uh, from MBA school is that price is king. What would MMA surgery cost? What would a CPAP cost? What would dental devices cost on average? So it depends on if you're in network or out, out, right? So we're having fewer and fewer maxillary, uh, oral and maxillofacial guys doing MMAs because they can make more money taking wisdom teeth out in 22 minutes, right, yeah. than being tied to this patient for six months. So uh, typical, I've had three patients in the last three months undergo MMAs through the UT Health Science Center, and the total cost with hospital stay, anesthesiologist, and the surgeon's fee was in the high 20s, okay, $27,000, $28,000, $29,000. That's going to be a little bit different, right, depending on what part of the country you're from. Probably cost you more in Manhattan, right, than it would here in South Texas. Uh, CPAP and dental devices, average CPAP is about $2,000. Right, and and uh, you you've got ongoing costs with CPAP. The the masks wear out. The straps that hold the masks on. The hoses, you know, have to be cleaned and replaced. And, and things like that. So you, you got a couple thousand dollars for the compressor, which like Guy said, they're getting better and they're getting quieter and they're getting smaller. But uh, those things can go out too. But you've got ongoing costs with, with, the, with that. And, and you know, the average dentist across the country is charging between two and three thousand dollars probably for a mandibular repositioning device. Rough. So, so it would be the same price then? Dental yeah, devices, it's two about, to three thousand? the same price. Okay, so, so there's no cost difference. Okay. So, so, the, so um, what percent, when, when you do the four pillars, when you do the screening, when you do the testing, when you get to the treatment, what percent go for MMA versus CPAP versus dental devices? Uh, MMA, I've been doing this 14 years, Howard. I've made maybe 6,000 mandibular repositioning devices, and I think I've, I've had five or six patients undergo MMAs. Okay. okay. So I then, mean, so then, what what percent would go CPAP over dental devices? Well, part of that depends on who diagnosed them, where the patient came from. You know, one of the challenges we have with if we we screen that patient and we say, hey, you need to get a, a sleep study done, and there's only one sleep lab in town, and we send them to the sleep lab. That physician, all he learned was CPAP. I promise you that, right, guy? That's right. all he knows. So he doesn't know that you exist in town. He doesn't know that he has a dentist he can refer to for a dental device. So the, the, one of the barriers that as dentists we fight is this medical model that's in place that everybody gets CPAP. You know, everybody gets CPAP. So our members, we kick them in the rear end and we say, hey, get out there and visit two doctors a week, right? two doctors a week. I want you to walk in their office, hand them your practice brochure and your business card, talk to the receptionist and say, hey, you probably don't snore, but your fat husband probably does, right? Come on over to my office and I'll treat him at cost, right? So that we can get in with this doctor and we can do that. I I'm not blaming the physicians, right? But most physicians don't know we exist. Most physicians don't know that this is a treatment option. So in the big scheme of things, Pretty much everybody gets CPAP. Ninety-five percent was uh, the latest study I saw in the United For market States. Market share uh, today. Now other countries are closer to fifty-fifty, and uh, that's why we started Dental Sleep Solutions and DS3 because that's just out of whack. Uh, you know the patients we screen and bring in through our practices, uh, the mild to moderate cases we 
present CPAP and, and dental devices, which one do you want? Most patients choose a dental device uh, for the ones who are good candidates. Patients who are mild to moderate, what is it, Rich? Maybe uh, three out of four that we diagnose are, are in the mild to okay. moderate category. Let, let, let's try to um, – at least nine out of ten people are listening to this on iTunes. So there's thousands of them out there that um, don't won't see you. Um, explain what this dental device is. Is it um, – is it something you take um, alginates for, polyvinyl siloxanes? Is it covered? Is it attached to the upper and the lower? And what what lab is making this? Do you guys have the lab, or is there a list of labs? Talk, talk about the dental device. Is there is there several different types depending on the the treatment plan? That, th there are, and that's one of the questions that most dentists have is which device do I make for which patient. So there's a hundred devices out there, Howard, that have FDA approval for the treatment of snoring and sleep apnea. Okay, 100. Okay, so we use mostly about 10 devices, right? The TAP device, T-A-P. If you're listening to this on iTunes, as soon as you get home, get on your computer, look up TAP. Look up the EMA, look up Somnodent, look up the SUWAD, you know, look up the uh, EMA, did I already say that one? The Narval. You know, there, there are several devices that uh, probably 10 devices have 95% of the market share. But basically what it looks like is good impressions, right? Polyvinyl impressions. Take a bite, a protrusive bite because we're going we're gonna to take this device and we got to fit your fit it together in space, right? So we need a, we need a protrusive bite with, it, with your maxillary mandibular teeth separated. And then we're going to do some kind of uh, acrylic or plastic, right? Take 2.0 bioacryl and do a suck down. Okay, this is how the typical dentist driving down the road listening to iTunes can think about this. You're going to put a button on the upper canine. You're going to put a button on the lower molar, right? And then you put a rubber band between them. So the shorter you make that rubber band, the more you pull the jaw forward. Right? And we, we're good at dentists, we're good at making things fit, right? I mean, you, you know, so we take a good impression, we get this thing back. So now we have a rubber band mechanism to, to move that. We have others that have little hooks and screws. We have others that have male, female type herps devices, right? Where you put shims on, things like that. But they're all, all made from an upper and a lower, and then they have some kind of mechanism to help titrate or move the jaw forward. And I want to add that we call these a lot of different things. They are mandibular advancement devices, or MADs. So they keep the jaw from falling back, or, and we actually move the jaw forward. Another word is uh, that we use are dental orthotics. We call them dental devices. Uh, there's also, um, what's the other? There's, there's several words that, that people use, and basically they're pieces of acrylic held together somehow that keep the jaw uh, in a forward position and keep it from retruding. So you may hear different terms uh, that are out there, and, and, and they're, they're most likely meaning the same type of device. But more, more specifically on the lab, so you guys don't have a lab yourself. You don't no. make these? No, um, we have, we have this, partnerships. But is this something they can send to their existing Crown & Bridge lab? I mean, I mean, what, 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 what's the chance their Crown & Bridge life makes a MAD device, a mandibular advancement device? Maybe the crown and bridge is not real high. This is more often done by removable labs. Uh, but, you know, maybe the crown and bridge lab may do it, and uh, so they can certainly ask. Uh, and, and a lot of the removable ones do. And so there's, there's a lot of different labs across the country. We, we use uh, quite a few. We even have partnerships with some that give our members discounts. Uh, so, yeah, if you've got a lab you like, then ask them. Uh, and, uh, what labs do you like? Because uh, I'm trying to right. guess. I always try to guess questions. You know, right. most everyone's listening to this alone in their sure. car. Almost right. everyone tells me it's probably 95% of commute to work, and they're screaming, well, what lab do you use? Yeah, well, we, we, we have used many over the years, and I would say the, the ones that we use the most are Keller Labs. We've been done a lot of uh, lectures and so forth. Is that forth St. Now. Louis? Yeah, but they have more than one branch in, uh, 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 th than just the St. Louis, and they're, you, know, you can get that nationally. We use uh, Somnomed. Uh, they do a, a, quite a few of our S devices. S-O-M-N-O-M-E-D. And Where are they out of? Uh, Texas, uh, I guess, right, Rich, still? They've, yeah. yeah and we use Dynaflex Lab, which is an orthodontic lab, so sometimes the orthodontic labs are the ones that are getting in, involved in this. Where's Dynaflex? It's out of St. Louis as well. I thought that. So Keller and Dynaflex are both out right. of St. Louis? Right. Yeah. Uh, Space Maintainers Labs. Uh, that's, that's out of St. Louis too, isn't it? No, that's more of, of California. Uh, so, is, if I'm not mistaken, and so uh, that that's you know, Rich and I are more East Coast people, but I think that's a a really popular lab out 
uh, out on the West Coast. And you, you've got one there in Phoenix, Gergen Ortho right. Lab. Gergen, Gergen makes a whole lot of sleep devices as well. You know, Great Lakes Ortho is an, another one that makes them. So National Dental Dentex Services Group, DSG, we work with. So, I mean, uh, there's... Uh, I, I guess we, you kind of put us on the spot here. We don't want to forget somebody like we're giving, uh, you know, people we work with here. And, and if we forgot somebody. And what, I mean, what, so, and what is the lab bill for this, uh, for a mandibular advancement device? And how much are you charging the patient for? I mean, a lot of dentists have in their head that if the uh, uh, five times lab bills will they charge. So if the, if, um, is there anything like that or? What is the typical lab bill and what is the yeah, typical well, charge? The, the lab bill will be 200 on the lower end. To, to the high sixes on the higher end, depending on which devices that you're going to do. And really, the, the answer to your question is difficult, but it kind of comes down to billing and what we bill and the systems you have in place. And, uh, you know, so what do you need in a practice to make this profitable? If you have good systems, and a lot of your staff does this, uh, we find a lot of offices can charge, uh, can receive $1,500. And when I say charge and receive it, you know, when we're talking about medical billing, there's, there may be a discrepancy there because insurance is paying some. And, but the total amount collected, a lot of offices can be quite profitable, uh, even more profitable than they are in other procedures when they collect $1,500. Uh, does that mean that we have offices that collect twice that? Sure. There's offices that, that collect you know, $3,000 a case. So I think somewhere in between there is, is, is what most offices collect. There's outliners where people get 1000 there's people get 5000 But we really haven't talked about that last pillar, the billing, and that's where really probably the biggest can of worms with this whole system is. Medical billing, if you've ever gone to the doctor, I just, uh, I've been to the doctor recently, and you get a bill uh, that says it was, you know, $5,000, but then they have insurance and write-off, and the next thing you know, it's, you know, you're, it, it, they allowed 3000 and you're paying, you know, 700 and uh, medical billing is complicated. We could talk about that for four hours in and of itself. So what we bill and what we accept and, uh, and what the office actually puts in their pocket uh, is kind of a complex formula that uh, really is, is, is one thing that uh, if they, dentist offices do this, if they get help with nothing else, uh, they should get help with that aspect of it uh, as so, well. So on the DS3software.com, do you teach the medical billing and or do you do the billing service for them? I mean, is that a service that you or someone provides? The answer is yes. We, we, we help uh, if the offices want to do self-billing. We, we can help them do that, and our software allows you to do electronic billing. We have a direct connection with 4,500 billers, and we can get instant verifications and so forth. We recommend as dentists first get involved in this, they let a third-party biller do this, and we have our own in-house third-party billing. We have hundreds of uh, dentists throughout the country we do the billing for. And we also connect with other third-party billers that, 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 that want to use our portal and you know our system because it makes their, their billing better. So, uh, And at any time that a dentist is using a third-party biller and they start doing a half dozen cases a month and they decide they want to move it in-house, then it's seamless. They can go ahead and start doing that. So all the above, I guess, is the answer, the answer to that. We recommend starting out with some help and hand-holding for this aspect of, of dental sleep medicine. And when, when someone goes down this path, is this something they will have to do this the rest of their life? Are they ever treated and cured from sleep um, disorders, uh, obstructive sleep apnea? Like, for instance, what, what, if, what if they were uh, – um, 250 pounds, and they law and they went down to 185. Would that go away? Ta will you talk about is is it a chronic, or sometimes is it acute? What are the other comorbidities that can be treated side by side? Is that too many questions for one uh, <laughs> for one question? Yeah, that's too many, Howard. You're going to have to distill that down <laughs> a little bit. No, no, but weight loss, right? Twenty. 20% weight loss usually equates to about a 15 to 20% reduction in the AHI, right, or the RDI, the, the respiratory disturbance index. So that's kind of the ways that, that we measure sleep apnea. We haven't got into that, but you have a sleep test, and, and how many events do you have? Well, I had 22 per hour, okay? Well, 22 is moderate sleep apnea. So that guy uh, weighs 220 pounds, 20% weight loss, right? He's got to get down to what's that, 44 pounds, so he's got to get down in the 170s, that kind of thing. So that's only a 20% reduction in that numbers. So, so most of the time, weight loss helps, and we always counsel people about weight loss. But, but usually, uh, sleep apnea, we have to remember, it's a progressive disease. And once you have this, it's getting worse with time, and it's getting worse with alcohol. Okay, so we're we are in a sense kind of married to these people and we start treating them. But that's part of the beauty of it, too. You know, a lot of insurance companies pay to remake the device at, at two and a half, three years. 
right? So, so is it um, – a lot of experts say that TMJ disorder, TMD disorders are 90% female. Um, do you see any male female – first of all, do you agree with that TMJ is majority female patients? And is uh, sleep disorders um, more male, female, or evenly, evenly spread? Uh, I agree that most TMD are, uh, issues are female, okay? Just as an aside, again, we talk about that for four hours. But <laughs> men have twice the prevalence of sleep disordered breathing until women quit menstruating. And within a year of a woman's last period, right, uh, <laughs> There's, there's a whole lot of jokes. I thought, I thought you were setting me up right. for a joke. I thought, okay, <laughs> I know this is a joke, but it wasn't a, a joke. Year, within a year, they catch up with men. So it's a men-dominated thing until the 45, 50, 55, right, somewhere in there. And then the women, then the women catch up quick. Interesting. Interesting. Well, if you, if you had a four-hour course on TMD on why women have it more, I mean, I, 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 would, I would love to get more online courses, I mean, any online course from you guys, because I think you guys are both really far out there in the lead on this uh, new direction. I mean, so many dentists, when, you know, when they go to, I just went to Greater New York, and it seems like every one of my friends that went there, I mean, they're, they're just trying to knock out, you know, fillings, bonding, root canals, and to go into these other things like TMD, you know, they're just, they're just not as common, I mean, on, on the CE circuit. You know what I mean? I do. We do. So, we do. Uh, so, um, so what's next? Um, so what would what would your clothes be? We're uh, we only got I only got you for four more minutes. Um, so can you, you you think you might do some online CE? Absolutely. We'll we'll uh, touch base after this and figure out how, yeah, how to I'm, get that I'm, going. I'm Howard at Dentaltown, and then we hired Howard Goldstein. We had two Howard, so he's Hogo at Dentaltown.com. Okay. But Mill Hogo at Dentaltown, and CC me Howard at Dentaltown, we'll and uh, um, I know uh, I, I I get questions on this every day. Right. Every day. Well, you know, yeah, and we'll, we'll make that happen, I promise. Uh, that sounds exciting. We're glad to be involved in doing that. Uh, I would close, at least from, from, from my closing here, to say if you're a dentist and, and you want to learn more about this, uh, we're, we're the resource for you. Um, we do courses all throughout the country, and I can honestly say no one does courses like we do. I think, Howard, you've, you've heard, heard me talk before in the past, and it, we've evolved a lot since you heard me years ago. And what we do is teach you how to do this in your office. I mean, we have no other agenda other than this is the systems in place. And even if you've done, uh, you're doing a, a dozen appliances a month or uh, dental devices, whatever we're calling them today, uh, we're going to make you more efficient at doing that. And that's what, what we teach is, is, look, here's the systems you need in place. Here's how you do it. And uh, we, that no, one, no one teaches it like us. So you can check out our website about that. We have courses all throughout the country. We have uh, our member meetings, too, that are uh, you can attend uh, as a non-member. You pay for them. Um, our members, uh, we didn't even talk about the benefits. We, we do online study club every other week for our members. That You talk to Richard and myself. Uh, we have uh, four member meetings a year that are hands-on, free for our members, a small fee for non-members to come to those. Those uh, staff members are encouraged to come to all these. So, so look at our website. If you if you don't know much about it, come to one of our courses. If you, you know you want to get more involved, we can give you a free trial of our software and our services. And uh, you can go online and start looking at all that online CE and just you know use it for a few weeks and uh, no commitment. Uh, we, we're very proud of what we've done, and we know that if you if you see what we have to offer, then uh, you're going to see that if you really want to do dental sleep, you're in the right place. And again, it's. DS3, three as in the number three, software.com. You can get to it from dentalsleepsolutions.com as well, but to go right into to where our uh, our services uh, for dentists are, it's DS and the number three, software.com. Uh, and, Guy, I just can't help but ask, but how come you didn't shave your head for this interview? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, you know, Howard, strangely enough, my hair started growing back after I uh, quit doing dentistry. I'm serious. <laughs> you, you met me a few years ago. Look, look at the difference here. So uh, that's what the lack of stress and uh, dental sleep has done uh, uh, done for me. Uh, maybe if you'll get involved, uh, you'll be looking like a hippie in no time. So, <laughs> hey, guy, I gotta, I gotta ask about your name. That's a, that's an uncommon name, G Y. I've never met anyone with a two letter G Y. And Yatros, uh, I've lectured around. That sounds so Greek. Is that Greek? Yeah, it's Greek for doctor, as a matter of fact, and there's only about a half dozen or so yatroses in the country. So yatros is Greek for doctor? Absolutely, yes. yes and it docere is. is Latin, correct? Docer, or is docer, I thought do, docer, doctor was docer, meaning teacher. 
But okay. Yeager, or is that Latin? And I didn't Yeager. know we were going to have a Latin quiz, so I don't know. <laughs> I know what uh, I know what Yatros means, and that's about yeah. the only Greek word I speak. So, <laughs> and what, and what, Gy, was that is that a family name, or did your yeah, mom? My, just... The truth be known, my legal name is George. Uh, my grandmother nicknamed me, named me that because that's my initials. And just because you know we're not good spellers originally from Kentucky, it made it real easy, and we would have misspelled <laughs> guy anyway. So uh, that's uh, oh. <laughs> that's why we have it there. So yeah. Oh my God. Well, hey, I just got. I got to um, I got to commit. I, I can't tell you, guy, how many times I've dropped your name when people have every time they say, uh, "Well, do you think there's a market for this?" I mean, am I wasting my time learning this? I mean, do you think I pay for this? And I'm like, guy does this full time. That's that's all he does. So how how can you say you don't have a market for this when this guy doesn't even do root canals and fillings and crowns anymore? I mean, there's a huge yeah, Howard, market. Howard, I want to tell you there are four members that we have with DS3 who've come out of school. They haven't done a filling yet. He yeah. just graduated from school? Just, I mean, in the things. last couple years, they haven't done a filling. In other words, they got out of school. This is all they're doing, and they're making a good living at it. And, and the their thing, hair is growing. And the thing I can't help but remember, you know, um, in MBA school, you know, they just kept saying, you know, your business, you know, you got to have something unique. You got to have a unique selling proposition. When everybody's the same, like a gallon of gas, a barrel of oil, a, a bushel of corn, you're just a commodity, and you all compete on price. What is your unique selling differentiation what, what what is your you know what makes you different and this is one of those ways where you can be really different than the dentist across the street what well, we're different in us is we really help dentists be successful I mean I, and I, I don't want to say this disparagingly but uh, there are people uh, services and companies that promise a lot out there in dental sleep and it's uh, almost us uh, you know giving a bad taste in some people's mouths for what we charge uh, it, it's just an incredible value and we help dentists do this. And, and to not get involved in this is, is to not uh, get involved in something that can be very life-changing for your practices, both in helping your patients and enjoyment. So, Well, uh, th well thanks for spending an hour with me because what I want to do is sometimes, um, you know, the dentist just wants to learn something with no strings attached, low cost first to see if they feel comfortable. And so to fly all the way to another city or buy a $5,000 device or whatever to learn more, is is they're they're kind of cynics. Then dentists are cynical bastards, no doubt about it. So to sit there and and have you guys spend an hour on a podcast, so they're on their iPhone, they're commuting to work, and no strings attached, no money, just low cost. Um, listen to that. That's why I wish you do an online CE course on this because uh, it'd be another low stress, low cost way for them to learn more. And then I'm sure when they see this bald beauty, Richard, and. Uh, and this hairy guy guy, uh, they'll probably uh, fall in love with you and learn more from you and then want to learn more. And then at the end of the day, that's what our patients need. Absolutely. We're excited to get involved. All right. Well, hey, thank you, gentlemen, so Sorry. much for spending an hour with me today. And I hope you have a rocking hot day. You too. Thanks, All right. Bye-bye.